All right, how we feeling? Nah, -uh, nah, uh I need more than that. It's like 10 o'clock now almost, 20 minutes or so. I just want to get like a temperature check from you all on how you're feeling because, you know, it's like when you go to a really nice restaurant and they serve each course, they give you a little finger bowl in between, you know, you got to kind of like let it all sink in. So how are you feeling after that last session? Are you feeling inspired? Yeah, it was really interesting, some of the topics that they talked about. It really does get you to think about something maybe in a new way or maybe just to get you to think about an aspect of the topic that you never heard before or thought about. That's the whole point of today. So I'm glad you're all here. We have so much more good stuff on the way for you. We talked all about men in the last session, right? It was all about how men can overcome some of the difficulties of our current society. We're not gonna leave the ladies out, right? What do you think the next session is about? All right, all right. Well, now that we're on that topic, let's talk about powerful women. We have one of the most powerful women in America in the building right now. She is, um, for me, I, I know I'm in the broadcast news industry and she's someone that I am very familiar with, um, having been in this business for quite a while. She is the president of MSNBC and she is in fact the first black executive, that goes for men or women, to lead a major news network. So I want you all to help me to welcome to the stage the president of MSNBC, Rashida Jones, and let's welcome back the Operation Hope CEO, John Hope Bryant. Do you have a preference? Is that the best y'all got? <laughs> didn't, she, didn't the lady tell you this is the first black president of a <laughs> network in American history? <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Thank you, my dear. Thank you, thank you. See, we, we just spoil you guys. <laughs> first this, first that, billionaire here, billionaire there. I mean, this is amazing. Thank you, my dear. You are amazing. Thank you. You're real. I'm real. I'm here. Yeah. You know I'm you real. You like exist. <laughs> You're not like a meme or something. No. <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. She grew up in Richmond, Virginia the place where the Confederacy called home. She grew up in modest, modest household. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that and unpack that a little bit. Yep. Um, for those ladies out here who don't believe that you can come up from nothing, uh, she, I believe the date was, the year was 2002 when you got your graduate degree or your degree in journalism. Yep. So we're not talking about somebody who's been in this game for 30 or 40 years. We're talking about somebody who literally graduated in 2002 and in 20 short years became the first black president of a network in U.S. history. And I think important to emphasize, when I graduated, it was from an HBCU, Hampton University. That's right. Which I'm very proud of. So, so let's get into this. Let's, let's talk about everything, the, the easy stuff, the difficult stuff, yeah. the oh my God, how did I get here, the, <laughs> stuff, the no good deed shall go unpunished stuff. Let's go back though to, I always love understanding how somebody like you gets built. Yeah. Because it doesn't just happen all by itself. So let's talk about what was your formation? Where did that self-esteem, one thing I love about every time we're together, Talking to you is like talking to Buddha. <laughs> you're just calm. Yeah. You're just cool. You're unbothered. You're, un, you're, you're unflustered. Yeah. That doesn't just happen naturally. And that's not confidence. That's self-esteem. You guys know there's a difference? Confidence is competence mm. leaned into the world. But self-esteem is how I esteem myself. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to wonder, want to understand why this world is so screwed up, if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. Yep. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's the big one. 
if I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life a living hell. Because whatever goes around, comes around. Self-esteem is so important. Yeah. And that, embedded in that is the presumption of self-love. Very few of us have been given the confidence and the self-love. And what I've felt from you from our very first meeting, and I went home and told Shatra when I, when I met you and how impressed I was with it, is this calmness. Where did that come from? I mean, I think for me, I was raised by very strong parents who made it not optional to feel good about yourself. They, it was not an option not to, astri- not to strive for greatness. Um, and it's something that I've always carried with me. You know, we, we grew up in a household where we were the only three black kids at our school. We went to a Catholic school. And we had to, you, there had to be a little bit of insulation um, away from what other people said and did to you and, and how they viewed you. You had to kind of insulate yourself a little bit. So I think I've always had that, um, you know, to your point, if you don't love yourself, but I also had a lot of love with me. My parents did not play. The expectations were high, but it was because they knew we could do it. You know, my dad would always say to us, if a person can do it, you can do it. And if you can't, explain to me why you can't. And there's no, there's no explanation, and so you just kind of had to live in that space. And so I think it was the combination of having the right people around me from, from very early, the right guides, the right mentors. But, you know, I'll also lean into what you said, believing in myself. And that's because I did the work, I do the work, um, you know, I... I, I my record speaks for itself, and so why would I not believe in something that I already know? Mm. I've always just kind of felt that. What hit me when you were talking, it reminded me, uh, it's alignment. Christy uh, from Wells Fargo was here last night, and she said her parents told her yes to, or never told her no, but there were consequences to what you, you said yes to. Yep. So no, I'm not telling you no, but just know there's consequences and a price to pay. Yeah. So I sort of hear the, a similar cadence in your family. There's these high expectations that had to go with your access. Right. I'm also hearing, when, if I got this right, that you were one of three black people in your school, which made... Whole school, right. Which made it mean you had to learn to deal with people who are different and difficult at an early age. Very much so, and, and I think, again, because I, ha- I had my sister and brother there also, we were very protective of each other, and we knew we had to be protective of ourselves. And so, um, when I grew up, I grew up in a very urban neighborhood and went to a very suburban school. So I, you know, on any given day, had to live in both of those worlds. And I think it's also why I've been able to live um, and, and feel comfortable at any table, any meeting, any conversation. You know, I always say, like, if somebody is uncomfortable with me, and, and I actually had a friend who said recently, there are some people who are going to be angry with you because you have the audacity to exist. Ooh. Right? And it was such a powerful thing. But the follow-up to that is that's their problem. That's not my problem. Like, if I make you uncomfortable being at a certain table, that's something that you have to kind of solve within yourself, but I'm not going to let that negativity come in. Amen. And it's not all negative. I mean, I will say, while you said the the, the good and the challenges and stuff, I've also seen um, an overwhelming amount of people who just want to root me on, who want to see me do well. I had this woman, um, she's a a prominent civil rights activist, and she, when I met her a few years ago, she came up to me and she said, you and I have never met, and I pray for you every single night. Wow. And it was so moving when she said that because she meant it. And then a few years later, we were at an event, and she met my mom and my daughter had both of them with me. I was, I was receiving an award, and I introduced her. And she told my mom that same thing, and my mom said, it is unbelievable how much of that I hear from people, and I feel so blessed that they get to see the person that I, that I have known for your entire life. So it's like you, you get that kind of thing too, and I've seen and gotten a lot of that just by being the first and, and, and knowing what it means for other people. A couple questions. Um, does your family treat you any, <laughs> is it a weird vibe when you go no. home? No. I will tell you this. When I go home for Thanksgiving, for example, I still have to cut up the cheese for the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Can't outsource that. Uh, <laughs> there are still plenty of carpets to be vacuumed, beds to be made. There's, you know, my, my family, uh, we, you know, we, we, do the things that normal families do. And, and again, that's part of why I think my relationship with them is so special because 
they both see the importance of what I do, but they also know just Rashida from Rashida. <laughs> It's just Rashida. I might have to cut up onion suit. Like, that's my least favorite thing, but they put me to work just like any other day. Yeah. yeah. It keeps you grounded. It does. Yeah, yeah. And the kids, too, they don't care about any of this other stuff. My daughter asked me to make dinner when I get home tonight. I said, like, get home at 10 o'clock. Baby, I've been speaking on this stage. She's like, no, I need a meal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just normal, normal yeah, life. I, yeah. I, I come in and tell Shadra, I just talked to the President of the United States. Yep, yeah, here's the trash. Right. It needs to go. It goes out that way. Out yep. There, yep. around <laughs> the corner. So, Richmond, uh, Pennsylvania? I was born in York, Pennsylvania. York, Pennsylvania. So, very small town. Nine What's the population? Miles. What it is now, but I know it's nine square miles, very small. What? Nine square miles. Nine square miles. Yep. So you can come from a little place and still do big things. Yeah. When did you get in your head that you might have the audacity <laughs> to become president of a network? And when did that become a real possibility? I mean, it was some, I remember exactly when I said the words out loud for the first time. And so I was, I was chatting with someone and, and he said, you know, what, what do you want to do? What's your next big goal? And, and I said, I want to run a network. And this was... When was this? This was a f five or six years ago. Okay. So not that long ago. Because I didn't even know it was a possibility. I didn't know it was a choice. I didn't know it was a thing I could say out loud. And, and when I said this to him, and this was, you know, he was trying to recruit me for a job and we got... Oh, back up, Rashida. Yeah. I want to... Please, everybody... This is Rashida Jones, <laughs> president of MSNBC, who said she didn't know she could say her dreams out loud. Can you repeat that? But there was power to that. I didn't know that it was okay to say something as bold and okay. aspirational, I, that I had the audacity to say it out loud. And this, this man who had a similar job, we get through kind of a more formal conversation, and then afterwards he pulled me to the side and said, you're gonna run a network. Hmm. I don't know when, but I, in getting to know you, you're gonna have that job. And it was, it, was, it was, again, I remember the moment, I remember where I was sitting, and it was just this affirming thing of, again, the thing that I knew and the thing that I fe felt, hearing it back from someone. And then when I, when I recounted that conversation to one of my mentors, Yvette Miley, she was like, well, why can't you? And what took you so long? <laughs> what, why, would you, why would you have that doubt? And so, again, when I go back to talking about your people and your circle, you have to have those people that, for the good and the bad are going to kind of shake your shoulders a little bit and say, you're capable of more, you can do more, even if you don't have the audacity to say it for yourself, I'm going to be here to, to push you. Absolutely. Um, we're going to get into the network and all that in a moment. I want to still stay with this theme, though, on, on, on your personal story for one second and, and leadership. It has to be lonely. There, what I would say is there are very few of us in jobs like this, um, but there are a lot of people out there who are willing to support, to give their advice, um, and just to even be a, a quiet place of, of, of support for what I do. But the reality is there are so few of us, and, and the industry isn't used to seeing that. You know, I, I um, mentioned to a friend recently, like, we almost have to reintroduce to them how you talk about black women in jobs like this and, and, and how you cover us and, and where the expectations are and our goalposts may look a little different from other people's goalposts. Um, and that, but that's real and it's, you know, again, I'd rather, knowing that I, I would rather be the first to have to kind of clean some of this up for the second, the third, the fifth, and, and so on. And I think it, it's why it's been so important for me to be as authentic as I can in this job. You know, I, I was uh, in a, I was hosting a panel for black leaders across NBC Universal a few months ago. And this is like film, parks, everything. And NBC is a big company. And I had this woman tell me on the panel, she said, I've been here for over 20 years. I have never said out loud where I went to college because I went to an HBCU and I didn't think my colleagues would understand. And I heard you speak and I heard you do the commencement speech at Hampton, and I've seen you just talk about Hampton so much, and I deliberately said, tomorrow I'm gonna to mention that I went to Fayetteville State on purpose to kind of make myself feel better about it. About it. But, but for me, that's the being authentic in the job, because I need to make sure the second, third, fourth, and fifth person, when they come up and they come in, they also feel comfortable being everything that they are and who they are exactly. So, absolutely. What I'm reminded of, I mean, I mean uh, uh, 
this hotel is so historic because Dr. King met here with Andrew yep. Young. By the way, he sends his best. He'll be here in about an hour. He, he wanted to let you know he's very proud of you. Thank you. Um, and I'm thinking that the things that we thought were extraordinary in the 1960s mm. are normal now. People take, yeah. people take civil rights for granted. Um, but it was something that Dr. King gave his life for, Andrew Young lived his life for, Ben Chavis is here, a, a lot of other civil rights heroes and she are here, Dr. Dorothy Hyde, all the people who do credit Scott King who don't get credit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope that this conversation was extraordinary now becomes something normal. people will take for granted yep. in 20 years from now. This hasn't become normal, yes? Yeah. Um, so you're breaking barriers. When you break those barriers, not only do you not get a lot of credit, you get a lot of grief. When Andrew Young became, when the Bachelor Young, Andrew Young became mayor of Atlanta, he told me the next day he was picketed by the civil rights community. And he went out and said, you guys are my friends. Why are you picketing me? He said, no, no, I'm not your friend. You're the mayor, and we're the advocates, and we're going to be on you. Yeah. And I'm sure it must feel weird that you get in this position, and people don't understand what it's like to run a balance sheet. Yep an income statement, run a brand, run international agreements, licensing agreements, business agreements, interlocking agreements. You got all these different things you've got to keep your hands on. You've taken, I think, an incredible risk in the midst of that, because you could have just said, I'm going to do nothing but be black and sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my check. <laughs> and you went in and you hired a bunch of folks who look like you mm -hmm. to give them a shot, and then you know, without getting a bunch of details, you get some of those folks who, for whatever reason, it doesn't work. And then you get criticized for making a, a business decision and get jumped on, legitimate or not, because everybody has a reason or a right to, you can say it's America, say whatever you want. I'm sure it must be extraordinarily frustrating because you're trying to do good. I'll just say I don't let noise deter me. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to open the door for so many other people. I'm here to build a pipeline. Um, I'm here to create opportunity, and that's where my focus is. No good deeds shall go unpunished. That's how it goes. But do good anyway. Do it anyway. Yeah. And, and what, are, what are some of the diversity? And, uh, people don't realize what some of the stuff you've done, you've done at the network to open doors. I want to talk about what's going on with the media uh, and the broader divisions before we wrap up, but, but talk to us about some of the diversity and inclusion stuff that you've done already in the network. Yeah, so it's been two years, and I, the, the makeup of our both on-air and, and off-air teams looks completely different than it did before. We've got more people of color hosting shows, and that's every, every group represented in a way where they can tell their stories in a very authentic way. We've got more people in the pipeline to become the next executive producers, the next executive leaders uh, than we've had in a very long time. Uh, this was an initiative that I started, but I've been a big supporter of and contributed to this, or this, um, this program called NBCU Academy, where we target schools that make up um, a majority minority students, and we go into their campuses, and we sit on their stages, and we train their, their students to become the next us. And so even that work has taken me to um, universities all across the country, really trying to build the, the next pipeline of, of the people who will sit in these chairs one day. And so, and, and, and you know, th those are the things that you can kind of see, and then there are the things that you can't see. There, you know, we have a, there's a small group of black leaders in our organization who now, you know, we, we have a safe space. We've got a place where we can kind of talk to each other and help grow and groom each other. And those are some of the things that I pour into. And so, you know, when you're in a job like this, you have, and you li listed all the fun, boring things that, that make up part of my job, but I also take very seriously res the responsibility I have to make sure I'm doing something to ensure I'm not the only, uh, just because I was the first that I'm not the only and I'm building a pipeline for the folks who come behind me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're such a class act. I, I, um, uh, I'm friends with Roland Martin. You're friends with Roland Martin. Roland's here streaming. Thank him for that. You, you guys find your sound disagreement on a recent issue, but you were disagreement. You had disagreements, but you weren't disagreeable. And privately, he respects you and, and is proud of you. You told me you respect him. Proud of him. And both of you are here today. This is what this is what America needs to be about. When we succeed, we need to make sure that all boats rise mm -hmm. and that we are lifting as we rise. Yes? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that I know for me, criticism makes me better. And you have taken criticism and called it a critique. 
and it's made it a sharper focus on your leadership. And now you're pivoting that into what you're leading at MSNBC overall. Talk to us, to me all this informs how you're gonna lead what, what people don't realize is an international network. The, America's divided. Mm -hmm. She's in a bit of a family fight. What are you doing to help to bridge, the, we're bridging the divide is the purpose of this meeting. What are yeah. you doing to bridge these divides here? Uh, I'm sorry, not at the network. Uh, and what can we look at going forward as some of yeah, the issues? You know, we, we talk about things that we take for granted as far as just the, the tone and the sentiment um, that the country experiences. It, and if you go back to like the 60s in, in, in some cases, it was bad then too. And I think as a journalist in our role in the media is we have to find ways to find commonality. We have to find ways um, without being inauthentic to find um, common goals and objectives. We have to put a spotlight on stories that maybe other people don't understand or don't get access. We have to find a way to bring these perspectives to light. But to your point about disagreeing without being disagreeable, we, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to be on opposite sides. But as journalists, we wanna make sure we're, we're adding to the conversation, we're adding value. Um, we're, we're putting a spotlight on things that need and to be shown, the but not becoming part of the story. And that's really where I want to continue to take MSNBC, the brand. Yeah. It must really, must really be hard when dealing with politics, as an example, yeah. to not become the conversation, to really, to not uh, really look and feel like you're on one side or the other. And I think you're, you're always trying to find that balance, right? And it, it, balance is, is exactly it. And I think we have to be comfortable with holding um, the powerful to account in all areas. You know, this is not a place where, um, you know, there, there are some networks that, that focus on kind of rallying behind a particular, a particular party. That's not what our focus is. That's not what our, our process is. It's not what our purpose is. And so I think in the same way we have had to question decisions from this administration as we did in, in, the, in the administration before, yep. I just think that's part of our job. Yep. And, and, you know, we're not adding, we're not helping to change anything if we're just continuing um, to reinforce the division. And NBC, I'm gonna go back to this diversity issue, which I think is really, so, that, so we're talking about what's outside uh, balance, and now we're talking about inside balance. You guys have an aggressive goal of 50%, is that right? 50% challenge. So this was something my boss, uh, Cesar Conde, started when he joined the company two and a half years ago. So uh, you, you have a very successful Hispanic male at the top of, of, of the food chain, so to speak, in, in our organization. That's impressive. It's very impressive, very impressive. And he runs, he's over all three of our news brands. I run one of them and, and uh, he's over all three. And so he came in, first goal, first objective, before you get to all of the business stuff, before you get to the editorial, was this 50% challenge. And the idea was that now as a KPI, we're measured against uh, ensuring that our teams are 50% uh, people of color and 50 per, at least 50% women and, and at least 50% people of color. And we've seen real change in that way. And so I think, again, kind of the same idea when you say it out loud, it makes it real. Um, we're all expected to, to live up to this challenge. You know, in the, in the last year, 60% of our hires have been women, 50% of our hires have been people of color, and we're really marching towards that direction. And part of it is not just to have a box to check to say we've done this, but it's to create a process where we've got a system that continues in this way. None of us will do these jobs forever. We'll continue to move on to big and, and, and great things, but what we've done is ensure that in the next generation to come, we've got a system in place to ensure that our newsrooms look like the country that we cover. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I haven't said this, I haven't said this yet at this forum, but I, I, I think it's important to say this. There's somebody watching this, and this is being streamed around the world. Uh, Roland Martin, uh, uh, CNBC is, is, do, is doing their part, uh, iHeart's doing their part. There's a lot of networks. It's being our, our operational channel. People around the world are watching this. I don't want somebody sitting in a, a rural southern area who happens to be Caucasian mm -hmm. and thinking, well, somehow this means I'm getting less. Yeah. Let, let me no. explain this to you. There's not a college-educated white man in America who has to worry about opportunity. We're talking about, listen now, this is a Stephanie Rule quote. We're talking about expanding the table and adding a chair. Mm -hmm. We're not retaking someone's chair. We're not cutting up a poverty pie. Yep. We're expanding the economy. We're expanding GDP. 
And to the extent that blacks and brown folks help to add one or two or three percent of GDP, gross domestic product, to the economy, even, I'll say it, even racist wins. Because when the economy expands, all boats mm -hmm, rise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we, sh we should not be talking about a zero-sum game or, 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 or this person got something and this person didn't. No, no, we're talking about American economy has never gone backwards because we keep looking at the future and expand, including more and more people. It's just that the immigrants don't look like Europeans. They look like Afropeans or something. <laughs> Latinopeans. I mean, it's, it's just darker, uh, a different hue, maybe women. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. joking about it, but I'm serious. Like, we, this, we've always had an immigrant story in this country. It's just that these immigrants look different. Right. But we need each other. Mm -hmm. We are better together. together. That's right. And I think that is what I'm hearing you say, is that you're, you're adding strength to MSNBC by adding diversity. Am I right about that? It, it, it has made us better. It's made us stronger, and it allows us to reflect the audience. Like, when you see yourself in the stories, because it's not just the talent, it's the stories that we cover, the kinds of programming that we create, you can relate to it more. We're able to reach people if, if they really feel like that they can see themselves in, in what we're doing. And that's really been a big focus. And, and again, not for the sake of just checking boxes, because it's, it's good for us as, a, as an organization. I have one final question. Yep. It's two part. Um, and if you haven't guessed, I'm a big fan of Rashida. I think, I hope it, I, I, I don't care if it shows through. I, I hope it does. Thank I, you. I, think, I think you're amazing. Thank you. Um, Two questions in one. One, are you optimistic about the future? Uh, and two, what advice do you have for that young black girl or young black woman, either a child or somebody in this audience or a woman sitting in this audience, about achieving in a world that has discounted you in their brain? So uh, I will combine the answers to say I am optimistic because of that future. I'm optimistic that there is somebody out there who's gonna achieve greats higher than anything we could imagine for ourselves or even for our, for our, our children. Um, I, I think that's important. I, I, we've, we've shown time and time again that we can continue to grow, we can continue to advance, we can continue to achieve despite the headwinds that come our way. And again, if I can do it and I'm ensuring that I'm creating a pathway for other people, Yes, there has to be somebody out there because it's up to us to ensure that that person gets the opportunity. It's up to them to feel confident to reach for something that may feel like it's out of their grasp. Um, and, and, and I think that's important. So I feel great about what's next. For the first lady, the first black person to run a network balance sheet in the largest economy in the world, the biggest media company, in, the biggest media community in the world, the first one to run a balance sheet and an income statement and do it with the dignity and respect for herself and for those she serves. Please say thank you to Rashida Jones. Thank you. That was so great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.